All right, so this is the second final hour of Physics 1B for September 8th, and we're now going to talk about measurements of pressure, pressure meters, basically. So I have here a picture. This picture comes, I think this is from your textbook. It must be because of all the strange image artifacts that show up all over this thing. But I find that it's quite challenging to just look at something like that and, and grasp what's going on. So I'm just gonna kind of slowly build it from scratch and we'll talk about what's happening and then we'll return to the picture. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is a barometer. A barometer is a device that is designed to measure pressure, okay? And the way that it works, this is, I think, primarily you use a barometer for measuring air pressure, like atmospheric pressure, okay? Um, this was originally invented by a guy named Torricelli, who did a lot of work, and we will see some other things in this class that, that, are, that are named after him, such as Torricelli's Law. So, how does it work? Well, first thing you need is you need a large uh, amount of mercury that you're going to put into a dish, kind of like this, shaped a little bit like a dog bowl. So we're going to fill this up with mercury, okay? And I'll just use blue for mercury. I'm kind of assuming you know what mercury is, but I would not in any way be surprised if you did not. Because mercury is something that we kind of try to keep away from people these days, as it is harmful to human beings, it's poisonous. But mercury used to be something you'd see in thermometers. It is a metal that is a liquid at standard temperature and pressure. So it's a liquid metal. Okay. Do you all know what mercury is? It's okay if you don't. Yeah? Okay. Have any of you ever played with mercury before? I. It's like super dense liquid that kind of like moves around. Have you played with it before, Andrew? You're saying? Yeah, like back in middle school they used to yeah. have it. Really? You went to a very, uh, a middle school where they did not care about your health, I guess. Yeah, surprisingly. It's really neat, though, isn't it? The way that it behaves. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's the way it's def definitely the behavior is a lot different from actually like your average water. Sure, it doesn't behave at all like water because if you pour water on the floor, it basically just spreads it all over the floor, right? If you if you pour mercury on the floor, if you if you break like a glass thermometer that has mercury in it, it'll break into a bunch of little tiny beads. They'll be like these perfect looking, almost like eerily perfect looking beads. And then you take the beads, and I, what I would do is, I mean, I broke a thermometer when I was, like, really young, and I took my fingernail, and I, like, pushed the little beads together, and you take two of the beads, and you push them together, they just kind of pop into a bigger blob. It looks so strange. It looks like something out of a video game. It doesn't look real. It looks so abnormal to see a metal do these kind of things. Anyway, so mercury is a very dense material, okay? And I'm not suggesting by any means you break thermometers apart. It is really dangerous. If you inhale mercury vapor, you can kill yourself, so... I'm lucky that I'm still alive, but then I've, I don't know. The density of mercury is really high. I'm gonna go back to the classroom this morning and grab what the density was. Density of mercury is this. And I'll put this one here by comparison just so you can see how much different it is than air. Okay, so the density of mercury. Mercury, the symbol is HG, by the way. HG is the symbol for mercury, so that's what I'm gonna be using to represent it. Um, it's 13,000, it's about 13 times as dense as water. It is a lot denser than air. It's about 10,000 times as dense as air. Okay, so we've got all this mercury in this in this container right here, right? The next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to stick a test tube upside down inside of it. Now this has to be a very, very long tube, okay? It needs to be almost a foot, uh, sorry, it needs to be almost three feet tall. Almost as tall as like, you know, half a human or like a, a very small human. So. We take a tube and we push it upside down inside of the mercury. So it ends up going in something like this. So there's our tube. And since we place it inside the mercury, what I'm gonna do is, we're just gonna kind of put some little dashed lines right back here. So there's our, our tube and we place it inside of here. Now what's gonna happen is that the air from the outside is pushing down on that, that surface of mercury right there. And what'll happen is that that air pressure 
acting downwards on the surface will drive the mercury up into this column right here and the mercury will rise up and it will rise up up until it hits some point up here at which point up in the top right here the pressure is going to be equal to zero so the pressure ends up dropping to zero as this mercury pushes its way up inside of here and that's basically a barometer now what will happen is that as the air pressure outside goes down the column of mercury will go down as the air pressure outside goes up the column of mercury will go up so all you need to do then is to just put a bunch of lines on your thing here and this is going to be something that's going to happen when we talk about um, uh, temperature too the way you create a thermometer is really similar and can be done with mercury if you really want to and then you measure this height and this height is going to be proportional to the pressure of the air and I'll show you how I know that so in order for this system to come to equilibrium what has to happen is the air pressure from the outside has to be in equilibrium with the pressure created by this column of mercury right here all right and so we can say if the air pressure is at exactly one atmosphere how high is the column of mercury like how high is it going to be from here to here from the surface of the liquid up to here this is a variation of pressure with depth problem we can say that the pressure of this column of mercury inside the mercury should be equal to the pressure at the top plus the density of mercury times g times h that's going to be the pressure right down here and i'm going to say that that pressure is going to be in equilibrium with the external pressure so in this problem we're going to say that the pressure has to be equal to one atmosphere and we're going to use that to solve for h now notice in my column up here that the pressure at the top is zero right basically this process of pushing this mercury in here is left pretty much a vacuum here at the top there will be mercury vapor and so there'll be a very very small amount of pressure but it's going to be very low so this portion we can call zero so we get the equation p equal to density of mercury times gravity times height we want to solve for h so we end up getting that h is going to be equal to atmospheric pressure divided by the density of mercury times gravity so this is equal to you want to go left probably uh, there's enough room here right isn't there so p is atmospheric pressure we have to put this in pascals 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals we want to divide that by density of mercury which we have up here 13530 kg over m cubed and then g 9.8 i can see we're running a little bit off the screen here so i'll move things over there we go and that's going to give us the height of the column of mercury if you calculate this out you should get something like 760 or sorry 0.76 I got 0.764. So that would be the height of the mercury column. This is why I said you need to make this thing almost three feet tall because 0.76 meters, a meter is about 3.3 feet, right? So 0.75 meters is three quarters of that. So it's, it's a little under three feet, but this thing needs to be very tall. We have one of these at the school it is massive. I will show it to you. Um, and yeah, it's really tall. Three feet is like, again, I'm five foot eight, so it's about, it's more than half my height. Um, okay, so that's what that is. And how is this then going to measure pressure? Well, as I said, if the external pressure goes down, right, if this number goes down, what happens to the height? 
It decreases. It decreases, yeah. So if it's a little bit lower pressure outside, then this little thing's gonna be a little bit lower. It might read 0.762 meters. So what you do is we come up with a new measurement of, um, you come up with a new measurement for pressure, which is um, a unit for pressure then is millimeters of mercury. And you will definitely see this when you look at the conversion factors. I think that the exact conversion factor, I mean, this should be it, right? I don't know, we can go look it up. I think it's 760, but um, let's go look it up real quick. So you write it like this, MMHG, millimeters of mercury, right? This is the same thing as 764 millimeters. So 764 millimeters of mercury is equivalent to one atmosphere of pressure. I just want to real quick um, make sure that I looked that up. So you can do one ATM and oh, it's, it's 760. I'm assuming this is their rounding. I, I always thought it was 762, so I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's just a definition or if the value that I used for um, this is wrong or if, oh, you know what? We could put 9.81 in. Would that change it? It should actually. You get 763 if you put 9.81. So it's probably really sensitive depending on what you put in here. So the actual number for the conversion factor they use is 760 millimeters of mercury. And again, I, I don't know why it's not exactly what we got, but I just want to be consistent and I don't want to tell you something that's untrue. So here we go, 760 millimeters of mercury. These kind of things are always very dependent on how many digits you use. And, um, you know, I know in Physics 1A, when I tell people to calculate the acceleration due to gravity and I give them, like, the mass of the planet, the radius of the planet, and gra universal gravitational constant, you always end up getting, like, 9.79. You never actually get 9.81. So I think it's... Sometimes they get, like, 9.762. So I think it's pretty normal that these numbers aren't exact, but I'm sure there's a reason why. Regardless, that's one way you can measure pressure. Does anyone have any questions? Alrighty, I'm gonna show you the other one that's over here. I'm not gonna go into details exactly about how it works because it works off of the same concept. The other option is a manometer. And a manometer, the way it works is you have this kind of vessel right here. And what you do is you hook up whatever gas you wanna measure the pressure of, you hook it up into a little slot right here. And then it fills the tube, creating pressure at the top right here. And then you have um, you have two different columns and you have a liquid inside of here. Let's say the liquid's water, for example. What will happen is that if the pressure in here increases, it's going to force this column of water to slide up, right? And the pressure is going to be the same at the bottom of the two tubes down here. So you can now look at the height right here of this column and use it to measure the pressure of the gas that you're feeding into here. So the barometer can be used to measure air pressure, atmospheric pressure. This the manometer can be used to measure pretty much any type of pressure because you can feed whatever gas you want into this, in this, into this vessel right here. Does that make sense? We're gonna do a problem with this. We're gonna look at a manometer, something like a manometer. Uh, let's do it. So, a manometer is a tube. Before we do this, I want to say a couple other things here, right? First of all, it's always a good idea when you look at something like this to check to make sure the units work out. I may have already said this last time. I'm probably going to repeat it a lot during this class. But let's check the units of what's going on right here. What's a Pascal? Can someone remind me what a Pascal is in terms of fundamental units or other units? What is a Pascal? Newton over meter squared, right? So we have in the numerator here, Newtons divided by meters squared. We're dividing by kg over meter cubed and then multiplying by a meter per second squared. Okay, but Newton is actually a kg meter per second squared. That's divided by, we'll just do times one over meter squared and then divided by all this other stuff, kg over meter cubed times meter per second squared. Now what we can do is we can cancel all of that out, all of that out, cancel the kilogram, cancel the kilogram. 
we have one over meters squared and one over meter cubed. That means that two of these are gonna go away and that whole thing's gonna go away. And we're left with one over one over meter, which is the same thing as a meter. So good, it checks out. The units work out that you get an answer that's in a meter. I mention this because it's always a really good idea to check these things. You can even just look at the equation itself and check to make sure the units properly work out. It will always be very helpful to you. Okay, now that's that, now the next question. Why wouldn't you use water for a barometer? Mercury, after all, is it's toxic to humans. Um, and yeah, so why wouldn't we use water? Why not just use something safe like water? Is it because it, the water doesn't have the same like char characteristics that mercury has? No. It, it does evaporate, that's true. It does evaporate, but we could always replace the water, right? We could always replace the water. It's not exactly super expensive. Mercury is, I think, probably pretty expensive. Density? What about the density, Wallace? What do you mean? You may be on the right track. Is it that it'd be, it'd have to be too tall to like? That's right, Ryan. And then Kate said, the, said something similar. Do you have to make the tube really tall? Of course you do, exactly. Because look at our equation. The height is inversely proportional to the density. So you can do this calculation yourself. How tall would the tube have to be if we wanted to use water? All we'd have to do is replace this number here with 1,000, right? Anyone want to guess exactly how tall the tube of water would have to be? If you're just going to make a guess based on what we learned last time? So I just did the calculation. It was 10 meters, so... 10 meters. Does that sound like anything else we learned about, like, last time? Like, last week? What else was 10 meters? 10 meters is obviously really tall, by the way. That's, like, I don't know, 33 feet? That's totally yeah, unrealistic, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, we could do a really cool experiment if we took, like, a, a big tub of water, right? And we took a tube... And we took it up to the top of a building, like on campus, that was like 33 feet tall. We could we could show that the water would actually rise 33 feet into the air through a tube. Um, you can totally do it. Yeah. Anyway, what was the 10 meters? What did we learn last time? Was 10 meters with water? Does anyone remember? The pressure doubles every 10 meters in depth. That's pretty close. It's, it's every 10 meters you go, you get an extra atmosphere, right? So it's like at 10 meters, it's two atmospheres of pressure. At um, 20 meters, it's three atmospheres. You just add an atmosphere of pressure every 10 meters, exactly. So, okay. That's how tall it would have to be. All right. So let's get down to this problem. All right. A manometer tube is partially filled with water. Uh, oil, which does not mix with water, is poured into the left arm of the tube. left arm, huh? Sure looks like it's the right arm in the picture, but okay. Uh, until the oil-water interface is at the midpoint of the tube, as shown. I've read this problem so many times I never noticed that. That's so silly. Left arm. Whatever. Maybe they changed the picture after they, and they didn't fix it. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway. Both arms of the tube are open to the air. We want to find a relationship between the heights, the height of the oil, and the height of the water. Now, this picture is just... I don't even know what to say about that, so I'm going to draw my own picture. So here's our YouTube. And like it says, we fill it up with oil and water. So on the left side, we have water. On the right side, we have oil. And in their picture, the oil is going up a little bit higher, so we'll do the same thing over here. In reality, it's gonna, well, we'll figure out what it depends on. Okay, and it says that they they meet at the midpoint, right? We wanna find a relationship between the height of the water over here and the height of the oil on the right-hand side. Okay, so both of these objects, it says, are open to the air, right? It says both arms of the tube are open to the air, right? 
So what does that mean about the pressure acting on the top of the water down here? It's one atmosphere of pressure. One atmosphere point. pressure, exactly. So I'm, we've been calling that P naught. So there's an atmosphere of pressure pushing down on this side. Likewise, if the right-hand side is open to the air, there's also going to be one atmosphere of pressure uh, pushing down over here. Now, right here at the middle, I would argue that they have to have exactly the same pressure. Why? Well, if the pressure of the water was greater than the pressure of the oil, wouldn't the water just push to the right? Likewise, if the pressure from the oil was greater than the pressure from the water, it would push to the left. So they're going to push back and forth on each other until the pressure is the same. At that point, there will be no more forces. And yeah, so the pressure here has to be the same. Now we know that we can calculate the pressure of a column of water by using our variation of pressure with depth equation, right? This equation. The pressure is equal to the pressure at the top plus the density of the fluid, in this case the density of water, times g times h. And over here on the right, we can write the same equation for the oil. The pressure at the bottom of the oil, p, should be equal to the pressure at the top plus, now we just have to put density of oil multiplied by g and then multiplied by h. Set them equal to each other. So if we set them equal to each other, we're going to have Oh, 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 I made a mistake. The height of the water and the height of the oil are not the same. So we have height of water over here on the left and height of oil over here on the right. Sorry about that, going a little too fast. By the way, this problem you have a problem very similar to it in your textbook, and I believe you have a problem similar to this in your lab manual homework too, so try to pay attention, it will help you. So now we have this equation, and our goal was to find a relationship between the heights of the oil and the heights of the water. So we go ahead and simplify this, cancel out the p naughts, and then rewrite the equation. The G's will cancel. What we end up getting is the density of water. I'm going to write it like this. Divided by the density of oil is equal to the height of the water. Oh, whoops. Height of the oil divided by the height of the water. That's our relationship. Now, according to this picture, right, if we look at our picture right here, and the picture that I drew here, the oil is higher. Based on this picture, do you think that the density of this particular oil, now oil comes in all kinds of various types, right? So not oil, not all oil has the same density. Do you think that the oil has a higher or a lower density of water based on the picture. If they're in equilibrium, lower. Why do you say that, Wallace? You are correct, it is lower in the picture. The height's higher, yeah. You need more oil to equal the same, effectively the same pressure more oil was needed, yeah. So the oil has to have a... So let's, let's pick some numbers here, I guess. So if we take the density of oil to be equal to... Um, we'll use... We have to use something less, right? So let's use 800 kilogram per meter cubed. I did look up density of oil in my last class, and I found that it has a wide range. Um, and then density of water over here. We obviously know what that is. Then we can figure out what the relationship is from this equation by taking the ratio of the densities. So if I take 1,000 on the left divided by 800, this should be equal to, what is, what is that? That's about 5 over 4, right? 
this should be equal to the height of the oil over the height of the water. That means that if the water has a height of like four centimeters, then the oil has a height of like five centimeters, right? Consistent with the prediction that you all made that the density of the oil had to be lower because it has a higher height. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, let's do one more conceptual problem and then I have a final kind of like more difficult challenge problem, I suppose you might call it. All right. Oops. Cut. All right, so consider the following scenario. You have a glass. This glass is filled, to, with, filled with water up to a certain point, and you place ice cube inside of it, okay? You place ice cubes inside of it. What does ice do when you place it inside of water? Does it float or does it sink? No. It floats, right? How does it float? Does it float where like a lot of its, a lot of its um, volume is out of water, or it's kind of like more like the iceberg we saw earlier, right? Where just a very tiny bit. It's partially submerged. Exactly. You used one of the words we learned. More under the water, right? So let's... We've got some ice cubes in here. They're shaped however they happen to be shaped. Um, that's the surface of the water. And here are ice cubes. So the question is simple. We let time pass. Right? And we say, what happens to the water level as the ice melts? Let me make this a little bit bigger. This doesn't seem much bigger, but there you go. Three options. Again, don't answer the question immediately. We're going to do the same thing we did before. I'm going to have everybody answer at the exact same time. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to think about this. Probably two minutes. What happens to the water level as the ice melts? Is the water level going to rise? Is it going to go down? Or is it going to stay at the same level? Those are your three options. I could give you another option of need more info, but you don't need more info. Basically, ice placed in a liquid placed in a glass of water what happens uh, please please don't answer don't answer the question you can answer it for yourself if you want to but i don't want you all to affect each other if that makes any sense so you have to give you two minutes i'm gonna let you think about this i did this experiment for my class earlier so i'll do it for you as well i don't know if we have enough time we don't really have enough time to melt the ice so i will encourage you to do this experiment yourself take a glass of water Put ice into it, right? Not so much ice that it's overwhelming. Just put a few pieces of ice in there. And then mark the level of the water. What I did was I marked the level with a, a, a Sharpie. But you could mark it even better with, like, a rubber band. If you've got a rubber band around your house, wrap a rubber band, right, around what the water level is. And then just leave it until it until it melts. And you can, you can figure out for yourself if what we're about to learn here is true. In two minutes, you won't have enough time for the ice to melt. So it's not going to... That won't work. But, um... Definitely, you could try this yourself. It's a very easy experiment to do. All right, I'm gonna give you two minutes. Think about it, and uh, I will have everyone put their answers at the same time. So you have two minutes. Feel free to ask questions if you want to.
Okay, so that's time. All right, so what I want you to do, even if you don't know the right answer, you still need to take a guess. It helps a lot to just check your intuition. Type your answer, but don't push enter. Just type your answer in the chat, don't push enter yet. You can either put a letter, a letter plus an explanation. Doesn't matter, just put something in there. At the very least, put a letter. You can also write rises lower, stay the same. You don't need to put in a letter necessarily. Okay, I hope that was enough time. Okay, so get ready to push enter in three, two, one, push enter now. See, this is really good. See, now we get all kinds of answers. This is great. Okay, Louis came up with a, an answer plus an explanation, nice. All right, let's see what we got here. A lot of A's, B's, and C's. Three A's, four. I see five answers for rises. One, two, three, four answers for lowers. And then stays the same is, it looks like the most popular answer. seven, eight, eight people said stays the same. Okay. I'm not immediately going to tell you the answer because I want to talk about what's going on here. So if you said A, why did you say A? Does someone want to argue for A? Uh, so my argument for A was that um, this is in a situation where, like you said, the ice cube is partially submerged. So that means yeah. part of it is in the water and part of it is above the water. Right. Um, so the volume of the ice cube that's under the water, that's part of the water level at the moment that you put the ice cubes. But the part of the ice cube that's above the water, that hasn't been fully integrated into the water. So that's extra water basically hanging okay. outside of the water level. So then once it melts, my it idea was that it was going to, yeah, it was going to make it go up. Sure. That's totally reasonable. Basically what you're saying is as soon as this portion up here melts, it has to make the water rise. Okay, that's totally reasonable. What about answer B? People that said lowers. Does anyone want to answer why they said it lowers? Uh, I put lowers because um, so the total volume is equal to the volume of the water mm -hmm. plus the volume of the ice cubes. Right. And um, uh, the volume is equal to the mass over the density okay and so since the ice cubes are less dense yep uh the denominator is going to be smaller so the volume is going to be bigger so at first so yeah. when you add the volume of the ice plus the volume of the water the mm -hmm. total volume is larger okay but then once the density increases the number gets smaller okay and so then the vol the total volume will be less that was my thinking okay so you were thinking about it as in ice form ice is less dense than water and so you were thinking then that once it converts to water it's going to be more dense which is going to make the volume go down because volume is mass over density that's your argument basically right yeah okay that's pretty reasonable i like that explanation and what about part c you want to argue for part c louis already said one thing andrew says when the ice is inside the water it's already accounted for in the water level what do you mean by that andrew I'm sorry, maybe your internet was cutting out there. I didn't hear you. Yeah, typing is fine, too. Louis, you oh. said... Go ahead, David, or someone was... Well, I had initially thought it was... Uh, well, my initial thought, like, quickly was A, that okay. it rises. Yeah. But then I thought about it, and I actually remember oh. leaving, you know, a, a glass of ice once, and it pretty much stayed the same. And I, I believe it's because of that massive... Since it's the same water is obviously cubes you know it just to me that mass that's in the waters is already rising the the level of that water so once it melts it's pretty much staying that same because if you take out the ice cubes it's going to lower down definitely agree with that yeah. if you remove the ice cubes we all agree that the water level will go down right yes 100 percent yeah, I believe when it melts, it'd be the same. It stays the same. Okay. That's my... Yeah. I like how you I like how you uh, leaned on your experience, right? You said, I believe I have seen something like this before in my life, and I'm pretty sure the water level stays the same. I like that because experience is the difference between modern science and, you know, I mean, you, you look at your experiences, right? 
Um, okay. Uh, anybody else want to uh, answer? I still haven't told you what the right answer is. I will tell you this much, though. When I first saw this question, I thought the answer was A. Personally, with all my years of studying in physics, I immediately thought A. It's got to be A. Why? Because if I think uh, people, people said similar things. Oh, there's a calculation. I love this. I like this calculation, Kate. Okay, so I thought A, and similar to what I think it was Ariana, you were saying, um, you know, the, the volume of ice, ice is, 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 you know, less dense than water. So when it melts, you know, it should make it rise, right? But the key thing about this problem, and I think that many of you have touched upon it, uh, is that um, if you think about it, the ice is not completely submerged, as was stated. And when the ice melts, right, it's obviously going to occupy a smaller volume, right? How much less volume, so pay attention, how much less volume is the ice going to occupy when it melts? The same volume it displaced. No, the question wasn't clear enough then. My question is, how much less volume, how much less volume will the ice occupy when it has turned into water? Is there any way to describe that based on the picture? difference between the ice volume and the, exactly I'm gonna write that into an equation what you said what you said uh, Ariana is exactly right it's the difference between the volume of the ice right Here, we'll, we'll write volume of ice minus the volume that's displaced which means it's actually exactly okay the amount of volume that the ice will occupy once it melts is going to be equal to the volume of the ice that is beneath the surface this is the difference right here. If you take the volume of the ice and you subtract the volume that's beneath the water, you're left with the volume that's above the water, right? So what that means is that once this ice turns into water, the level will stay the same because as that melted ice on the top melts, it's not going to raise the volume because, yeah. Basically, the moment that that ice turns into water, the difference between the volume of the water and the ice is going to be just this amount that was above the surface. Roberto, I gotta mute you. It sounds like getting some outside void noises. I don't know. Does that make sense? Sorry, I was getting distracted. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm explaining something and like someone's mic's going off, I get really distracted. I'm, I'm a very hyper-focused kind of person. Basically what happens is that when it melts, all this portion that was above the water, that's just the amount that the water will... I'll just start from the beginning again. We've got some ice, right? And we know that part of the ice is above the water. We also know that ice has a larger volume than water. So if it were the case that when the if all the if all the ice was beneath the surface and it melted, then the water level would rise. Oh sorry, the water level would go down. If all the ice was beneath the surface and it melted, the water level would go down. Because the volume of the ice an ice form is greater than the volume that it will have when it turns into water. Now, when it's floating on top of the surface, though, you've got this huge portion of the ice that's actually beneath the surface, right? And a very small portion of the ice that's above the surface. It turns out that the volume of the ice, when it turns into water, will be equal to, okay, just the volume of the ice that's beneath the surface. Because the difference in the volume of the ice versus the volume displaced is just the portion above it. Did that make sense? Yes. Okay, it's been a long day, so I apologize if it didn't make complete sense. But the main idea is that when it melts, this stuff is going to melt into the water, and it's not going to actually increase the, the volume of the water. Or the, the level of the water, sorry. Okay, one last question. This is going to be a kind of a tricky problem. It will show up on your homework, and... This is something that shows up not only on your homework, but it also shows up in the lab manual. Right, Ariana. It, re it It's a larger volume when it's frozen, exactly. 
ice and water are very unique in that sense because I'm pretty sure that most substances, when they turn into a liquid, are actually denser. So, you know. Okay, so we're going to do this problem. This problem is very different than any of the problems we've done so far. It's probably considerably more difficult. And I will do my best to finish it up. We don't have much time left. We've got like seven minutes. So we'll try to start it now, and if we don't finish it, I'll try to summarize. Normally what I would do is draw my own picture here, but I just don't think we have the time for that. So we're going to use their picture. Now, unfortunately, it's got a lot of stuff on there that I wouldn't like, but... Okay, this problem is called the force on a dam. It says water is filled to a height H, capital H, behind a dam of width W. So the width of the dam is W, the height of the dam is capital H. We want to determine the resultant force exerted by the water on the dam. So this gray little looking thing here is the dam. You'll notice that the dam is constructed such that it's thicker on the bottom than it is on the top, which should make hopefully some sense because we know that the pressure down here is greater than the pressure at the top, right? So you need more structure down here to hold the water back because the water pressure down here is higher than it would be at the top. So our goal is to find the force of the water on the dam. What have we learned so far that can relate things that we know about fluids to forces? There's only one equation. How do we relate, how do we figure out the force of a fluid on an object? What is the, um, what equation can we use? I know it's very late, so we'll just write it down. It's pressure equals force divided by area, right? That's the relationship between pressure, force, and area, which we can rewrite as force is equal to pressure times area. Now, we can find the area of our dam, right? There's the water pressure, there's the dam. What would the area of this face of the dam be? It has a height, h, and a width, w, so you just do w times h, exactly. Width times height, right? Okay, what about the pressure? So, is the pressure right here the same as the pressure down here? No. No. The pressure changes. In fact, we know exactly how the pressure changes, right? We know that if the pressure at the top... It, uh, sorry, yeah. The pressure is equal to the pressure at the top plus rho gh. Right. So because this H shows up here, that makes this problem a little bit more challenging to do. We can't really find the total force. We're going to have to either average the force at the top with the force at the bottom, or we're going to have to do something else. What we're going to do is we're going to take our dam and we're going to break it up into tiny little strips like this one that was drawn here in red break it up into tiny little strips. And what we're gonna calculate is the force acting just on that one strip, okay? And I'm gonna call that force DF. Once we find the force acting on one strip, once we've come up with an expression for it, we're then going to sum up the force acting on individual strips as we go down here, all right? Now, in order to do that, we're gonna have to rewrite this equation here. We're gonna write it like this. Suppose we just look at the pressure acting on a small strip of area that we call DA. DA is gonna be this red strip right here. Okay. DA represents a small differential area or just a tiny area, okay? And in this case, that area is going to have a thickness dy where y is measured in the positive direction this way. You're correct, if you say it sounds like derivatives, we're gonna head into the calculus world for sure. So look at the axes here. The positive x-axis goes to the right, the positive y-axis goes up. The distance from the origin up to where our strip is has been defined as y. And then we're defining the thickness of our strip to be dy. We know the width of our strip is still w. Can you tell me, if I have a strip which is shaped like a rectangle, has a thickness dy and a width w, what will the area be? 
W dy? Yep. W times dy. That's what our area is. Okay. Let's look back at this equation right here. Our equation says that the tiny force, when I put a D in front of something, it pretty much just means tiny. Tiny force is going to be equal to pressure times dA. We can then replace each of the terms. The pressure is going to be P naught plus rho GH multiplied by dA, but dA is equal to W times dy. That will be the force on a single strip right there. Our little strip is going to have a force that's equal to this. Now what we'd like to do, now well, first of all, let me just make sure you all understand. Uh, the pressure is going to be the same on that strip, right? Because it's a single height. So that's why the pressure doesn't have like a, a D in front of it or anything like that. The pressure is the same all throughout this object. Look at that equation and it let, ask me any questions that you have. We have two minutes left, so I'm going to kind of speed through this derivation. Now, if I want to add up the effect of all of these individual um, forces, because we're going to break it into a, a strip at the top, and then a strip right here, a strip right here, a bunch of strips, we need to integrate. An integral is, after all, basically kind of an infinitesimal sum. On the left-hand side, we'll just get force. On the right-hand side, we're going to be integrating P0 plus... I'm going to pull the W out in front. P0 plus rho GH dy. And we're going to integrate from the bottom to the top. So we're going to integrate from y equal to 0. This is the y direction, right? y equal to 0 up to capital H. Now, I can't immediately do this equation because notice from the picture, the symbol H represents the height from the top, right? And that height h is directly related to y and h over here. y is basically this distance. So how are capital H, little h, and y represented, or related to each other? I would say that capital H is equal to h plus y. Can you all see that on the picture? Rearranging, little h is then equal to h minus y. Let's plug that into our equation. So that's the integral we need to do. It's not particularly difficult, but we're still going to do it. Okay, so... When I do this integral, the integral from 0 to h of p naught, p naught is a constant, right? p naught is just air pressure. It's the pressure at the top, right? p naught is one atmosphere. So if I integrate p naught dy, what do I get? What happens if I do this integral? Integral from 0 to h, p naught dy. What's that equal to? P naught's a constant, right? The P the P goes out the integral. P naught times Y. P naught times Y, that's the answer, right? Yes. Okay. So P naught Y from zero to H. Here we'll put the zero to H at the very end. Uh plus. We've also got a term that's rho G H D Y. Also, rho G and H are um what do you call it? Um, also constants. So we're going to get rho GHY. So the first two terms. Minus, we also have a term that's like rho G times Y that's negative. So now we have an integral that's going to be Y DY. What's that integral going to be? What's the last? What do I write for the last term here? Uh, y squared. Y squared. Y squared over 2, exactly. It kind of looks like a 3, sorry. This is going to be y squared over 2. 
we have to evaluate that entire thing from zero to h. So what do we get? We're gonna get w p naught times capital H plus rho g h times h is gonna be h squared minus rho g h squared over two. And then when you plug in zero, you'll get zero for everything. So we end up getting f is equal to w multiplied by the p naught multiplied by h plus rho g h squared minus rho g h squared over two is gonna be rho g h squared divided by two. And that is gonna be the force on the dam. It's pretty tricky. You have a homework problem like this. You'll see some stuff in the lab mail that's similar to this. I wanted to make sure we covered it because like I said, as far as I can tell you, this, this is not covered in your book, but there's problems like this in your book. So I found a problem for another textbook to do. That is all the time we have for tonight. I'm gonna to stop now. Uh, remember, we do have lab. And our, our next meeting is a lab. We're doing lab F-4. Read the lab. The only people that need to come to lab are the people that are in the first uh, half of the alphabet. And we said that that's going to cut off at Jordan Levin. So if, you, if your name is Elias Marquez or any of these names that are later in the alphabet, you're going to be showing up one week later. And for the rest of you, numbers 2 through 15 here, we have a lab. It's on Monday. Thanks for coming by tonight, everyone. Uh, try to show up, definitely show up early, mostly just to get into campus. As long as you get to the lab by 6.30, that's fine, okay? But just get to the campus at like 6 p.m., 6.15. Give yourself enough time. I apologize for going a little bit over tonight, but uh, we're, in a, we're in a weird spot here, missing Monday for the Labor Day weekend. Want to make sure we cover everything. At this point, you have enough information to solve all of your homework. It's due Monday. Be sure you start working on it over the weekend. If you have questions, I have office hours tomorrow. I have office hours Friday. And that's it. Good night. Ryan, for now, let's just say you get the day off. Probably a little bit later, I may have to change that. But uh, can you get a P for today? Is that a present? Sure. Louis, what's your last name? Anybody else needs to get on the... Avalos. No problem. I need to stop the recording.